Yeah, so welcome everyone and welcome to you, Britt. We're very excited to have you here. Uh, if you haven't heard about YBC Growers, we are a farmer owned cooperative uh, that seeks to do everything we can to uh, improve environmental outcomes at the same time as well as farming. And so we're very excited to have Britt, who is a wine educator, a wine steward, um, and uh, someone who is very passionate about regenerative wine. Although uh, maybe that's going to be my first question, Britt, is what is regenerative wine? Yeah, so it's, um, we, we were chatting about this the other day, but there's really no such thing as regenerative wine. Um, in the wine industry, we call it sustainable winemaking. So that's kind of a giant blanket expression. There's no certification behind it. But the focus on sustainability in wine is the uh, production of the grapes as well as the production of the wine. So um, on this planet, there's over 18 million grapes under vine. And there's been a number of winemakers recently uh, that have made a move towards protecting the soil um, the, same, the same way that regenerative agriculture works. So one of the things I really like to focus on is that wine is a consumable thing just as, um, just as food is, just as your, your fruit is, your vegetables are, the grains that you get for your bread. Um, wine's essentially just made from grapes and at its basics, it's made from really, really well-grown, beautiful grapes. Um, but the best way to express that fruit and the best way to um, create good wine is to make sure it's coming from healthy vines. So there's been, again, a number of winemakers, Oregon's um, done a fantastic job of sort of championing this. And there's some older regions in the world, France and Italy, who have always been making wine and respecting the land. But um, essentially, I guess, in a nutshell, re regenerative wine or sustainable wine is wine that's grown from healthy soil. Um, so keeping cover crops, um, not using conventional pesticides, again, kind of following the um, same ethos of regenerative agriculture in general. Um, a lot of these winemakers are using things like fermented teas. They're very holistic in their approach. Um, they're not doing blanket treatments. They're going out and they're treating their vine sort of one by one on a case by case basis and watching their little plants crop up and things like that. Um, and then once their fruits harvested, they, um, they're not tilling the soil, they're trying to avoid machines going in to pick the grapes. So most of their fruit is hand harvested. Everything's very gentle and in tune with what the vineyard um, kind of is needing. Um, and then they take their wine and they, they're using um, low intervention methods in their wineries as well. So um, they're using solar powered, um, solar, solar powered energy or hydro energy, um, if possible there using neutral oak barrels for aging so that they're not overproducing wood and things like that. Um, using indigenous yeast instead of conventional yeast to um, kickstart fermentation. So um, yeah, there's, there's a move towards natural wine right now as well, um, which is similar to regenerative, but um, doesn't encompass all of the things that go into regenerative or sustainable wine making. So hopefully that kind of sums it up in a no, sure. Fascinating. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. Um, so yeah, very interesting. Like, so we, we, we sold this as regenerative wine and, and you telling us that there is no such thing. So that's, I, I love that turn of events. <laughs> but so yeah, so the industry calls it sustainable yeah. wine. Okay. So if we were curious about wanting to kind of find more wineries and, and wine that, that was done this way, that's what we'd be looking for. Right? Yeah, definitely. So if you were to just, um, I mean, if you wanted to sort of go down a rabbit hole, there's so much information, um, but just, just look up or Google search sustainable winemaking. Um, a number of winemakers are going to pop up. Um, I guess the thing to notice is to note as well is that um, some of the, the better, probably more sustainable winemakers don't have those big budgets to uh, get all the Google hits and things like that. So the best way to learn about sustainable wine is to kind of um, visit local shops. If you're in Calgary, we have a number of great shops um, that have really knowledgeable staff that can kind of steer you in the right direction if that's what you were looking for. Um, and sustainable wine doesn't have to be expensive. I think that's the one thing that is really intimidating for people. Um, first of all, buying wine can be so intimidating. Uh, because it's something that's consumed so often, but not a lot of people know about it, but you kind of feel like you should know what you're talking about. So people stick with what is very familiar to them. 
Um, and there's shops like Co-op, which is great, but they're very convenient and there's not a lot of um, sort of knowledgeable staff on site. So um, walking into a boutique shop like J Web or Bricks or Vine Arts uh, or Vinestone out if you're, if you're out in Cochrane, um, the staff are super friendly and really, really sort of keen to help sort of preach all of the goodness about sustainable wine and these incredible winemakers. So it feels intimidating going into these stores asking them for help, but, um, but yeah, they're happy to help and they can find just a great bottle for under $20. So it doesn't have to be, um, yeah, it doesn't have to be painful on your pocketbook. That's great. I think we might want to capture some of those wineries or like bottle shops uh, going forward. But uh, I'm, I'm curious, you know, does, uh, does wine, like what's the difference um, between wine grown in a sustainable manner uh, versus wine, the, what, you know, is there a conventional wine system? Uh, and and why, why do you think regenerative or sustainable wine is better or different? I love this question because it's, it's so easy to understand if you really think about it. Um, so conventional wine, and I don't wanna, I, I always use apothic because I think everybody has heard of or drank apothic wine at some point in their life. Um, and I don't wanna slag on it. If, if that's what you're drinking right now, that's great. And if that's what you like, that's perfectly fine. It's a good way to get into wine. But if you are interested in, um, maintaining a healthy uh, environment and uh, ecosystem for our planet. Apothic is not the way to go, unfortunately. So conventional wines are typically um, grown. Um, they, we have some great photos we can bring up at some point, but conventional wines generally don't do things like cover crops and use natural fermentations or natural um, like fungicides and pesticides and thing like, things like that. What they do is they, they sort of take the roots, they allow nothing to grow around it. They don't, it takes time to, to keep an eye on these weeds and these little plants that crop up. Um, but they also don't allow the fruit to ripen fully, which is kind of a bummer. So um, yeah, if you think about when you bite into a peach, for example, and right now, YYC Growers has these beautiful peaches that are from BC, they're perfectly ripe, they taste so juicy and they're delicious. Um, they're not quite as affordable as the Chilean peach that you're going to get in the middle of December at Safeway. Um, but that, that peach is also quite tart and underripe and you can't taste the fruit in it. So if you think about wine and its production as well, you want to make sure that you're getting really healthy, um, juicy grapes. Uh, wine again is made from fermentation so that the sugars in those grapes need to ferment to be able to hit a certain level of alcohol. And if you're using underripe fruit, you don't have sugar to ferment. Uh, you also don't have colors in your skins, which is where you get your color for your wine. So what winemakers have done is they've taken unhealthy underripe fruits, uh, conventional winemakers, and um, in order to get them to levels of sugar that can even be fermented, they dump in bags of white sugar. They add this dye that's most commonly known in the wine industry as mega, mega purple. Um, and that's kind of how you end up with a, a full-bodied, flavorful bottle of wine from some of these conventional wineries, which is very misleading if you think you're getting grape juice, fermented grape juice. So, um, Wow. <clears throat> I think a bummer. <laughs> I think I've just uh, had my mind blown. Um, and part of that too is, is like when I've, you know, started kind of learning a little bit more about wine, um, what I had understood is that the, there, there's an understanding that stress uh, on the plant is is actually what makes an interesting wine. And so are you telling me that that's maybe not the case? Yeah, I mean, it is and it isn't. So um, grapes, I mean, if you think about grapevines, some, some of the best grapevines in the world are 50 plus years old. So it takes a lot of time for those vines to kind of dig deep down into the soil. So what you're getting on the surface isn't necessarily what the vines are feeding off of anyways. Um, grapevines go straight down. They don't typically, I mean, varietal to varietal, it changes slightly, but in general, they don't kind of lay underneath the surface and benefit from all of those nutrients that come from rich, healthy topsoil. Um, so yes, grapevines do grow quite well in sort of limestone and quartz and really rocky soils. Um, and you get things like that around the Okanagan Lake from all of the sort of alluvial sediment and glacier till and things like that. 
but on the surface, you still need to be able to encourage fauna to come into the vineyard. You still want bees and butterflies to help pollinate your fruit. Um, there's some companion plants, and I can't think of any of them right now, that do really well uh, within vineyards because you have pests like powdery mildew that need to be combated. So yes, grapes do grow quite well in poor soil, but on the surface, you still want all of these beautiful um, components. You wanna have a really rich, diverse ecosystem for the grapes to grow in. And um, yeah, another way that winemakers will do that is they'll start introducing livestock into their vineyards, which is amazing. Um, it just kind of brings it back to that sort of holistic approach you were talking to at the beginning, Rod, where everything, all of the pieces need to work together. So, uh, but again, to have livestock in your vineyards, you need to have something for them to munch on and having natural grasses is a great thing, so. Wow, that, <clears throat> I don't know if anyone else, um, if that was new information for anyone else on the call today, but that's, that's fascinating. And, and I mean, I, I understand, like, so we use a bricks tool in farming uh, that actually measures the sugars that are in a plant. Um, and then when you have a higher bricks or high sh higher sugar level in the kind of, say, a lettuce leaf, what you immediately experience is a higher flavor. Um, and so I wonder if like, is that, that must be the same thing in the, in the winery industry. Yeah, absolutely. I actually, that's news to me. I didn't realize that, that was something that was used in farming. Um, but yeah, it's, it's the exact same. There's such a symbiosis between, um, grape farming and farming and everything else. Cause it's really right. just farming, but, uh, yeah, sugar levels in wine are also determined by bricks. So. Okay. Yeah, and then and then yeah, as long as you're getting the, the plant to naturally, and so we do that by taking care of our soil. So that increases the the level of bricks bricks in our plants. And so I yeah, so I'm like, I'm sold. Um, <laughs> let's not stress the plants, stress the grapes anymore, because then let's get the sugars to naturally occur. Then to your point, um, that fermentation, like it has sugars to then ferment uh, yeah. rather than putting in the the powdered white stuff totally and it just makes it just makes for better wine and it's better i mean it's better for you there's all of these health benefits around wine um but it's really tough to find those health benefits if they're masked with sugar i mean wow. the benefit is the phenolics that happen through ripening so um you have to allow it to happen and i think i mean in talking with certain winemakers i i think the majority of them truly do believe that if every if every winery in the world started to move towards Regen Ag or more sustainable practices, um, it would actually be more affordable than spraying with conventional sprays because, uh, I mean, it's it's a quick fix, but it's not it's not long term, and you have to spend money on that stuff every single year. Where if you just kind of take care of something, it just maintains itself eventually. Wow. That, yeah, this is a huge parallel. I think when people transition from conventional agriculture um, and reduce or eliminate their pesticide use, um, that, yeah, that's their biggest expense. And if we can create a soil and ecosystem that actually has all of its own kind of health benefits baked into it, um, it does resist disease. It does resist pests when, when the plants are functioning at a healthy state had a healthy state um so you you then yeah the more that you dive into kind of healing the soil the more the more that you don't actually need these other interventions because um it's 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 this like cycle of life generation um yeah very generative yeah. um uh, this is this is so <laughs> i'm so excited <laughs> right now um and and uh and so then obviously you then know some folks um, just like I know some passionate farmers, um, you must know some passionate wine vintners or know what do they call themselves? And maybe yes. do you have a couple stories about some some wineries that uh, yeah you can tell? Totally. So I um, yeah I can I drop the can I can I drop the ball? I think we've already talked about how YYC Growers is coming up. Oh sure. Let's now let's talk that. Can I spill that quickly? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so YYC Growers, Rod and I had this amazing talk about a year ago, just getting really, really excited about all the sort of symbiosis between wine and uh, agriculture and everything. And um, 
And to that, YYC Growers is launching a wine club and a small online wine shop which uh, is going to feature some of these amazing winemakers that I've had the chance to connect with over years. Um, one of my favorites and sort of my dive into regenerative agriculture, even deeper in the wine industry, it's always been on the surface for me, uh, was last year writing an article. And I was interviewing a number of winemakers out in BC and Jay from Bella Farms was one of them. Um, and I think it's important to note that a lot of these winemakers call themselves, if you're, if you're looking them up, they note farms in their name as opposed to winery. Um, so there's Bella Farms, there's Avril Creek, there's Chirelli Farms out in Italy, um, but, but they're, they're, they are truly farmers. And I had this amazing conversation with Jay. I thought it was gonna be a 20 minute interview and I pulled over for two hours on the side of the road. And he was just talking to me about all of the little things that they do, um, sort of the fermented milks and teas that he uses um, Jay's an exclusively sparkling wine house in uh, Okanagan. And he's just this big, lovely, wonderful person. He has pigs that kind of wander around the vineyards and they provide natural fertilizer. Um, they, they sort of till the soils naturally with their hooves, which is great. They provide just enough disturbance um, to kind of keep things going, but it's, it's not really um, damaging in any way. And he has chickens. Um, his wines are absolutely stunning, but he's such an inspiration to me. Um, and then there's Marcus Anselms from Daydreamer, who's a winemaker from Australia that kind of nestled into um, Naramata as well. And he is such a strong advocate for using indigenous yeast. His vineyards are wild. Um, they're absolutely beautiful. You can see these gorgeous long grasses that crop up in between the rows. Um, but yeah, one of the things that both of them really reflected in my conversation is Canada's kind of trying to find its footing as a wine region right now. We've never really put um, our stamp on a particular style or anything. You think of Italy and Tuscany and Sangiovese and things like that. You think of France and you, mine kind of goes all over the place, but they said Canada's got this really great opportunity with so many winemakers diving into regenerative agriculture to really express the flavors of our soil and to work with what's happening um, with the environment rather than working against it, creating wines that um, grow really well within our, our climate, and within our region. Um, so I think it's, it's very exciting for regenerative agriculture and sustainable winemaking to be coming around because a lot of these winemakers are so thrilled about it. And there's um, the Mavity family from Blue Mountain who's been making organic wine before organic was a label uh, in the 80s and some of their wines we featured through YYC growers as well but they are sort of now one of the the benchmarks for um, sustainable winemaking but um, yeah and there's amazing winemakers in Italy that we'll be working with uh, Chirelli is one of my favorites I'm gonna if I can just dig for a moment there's this one lovely quote off of Chirelli's um, website that I just love. Of course, I can't find it right now. Anyways, they kind of muse on about how um, wine is their livelihood, but if they don't protect the environment and where their vines come from, they can't continue to do the things that they love to do. So I think that's really the general, the general thought with all of these amazing winemakers is um, to protect all of the things that allow them to, to do these jobs that they love and they're so passionate about because without a healthy environment what are you going to do <laughs> yeah well said um yeah that definitely resonates with with the farmers here on this in this ecosystem um this is a this is a new question um kind of inspired by by the conversation that we've been having but a lot of times I'll go to a restaurant and one of the, the main things that the restaurant wants is consistency. So they've, they've determined a set menu. Um, and, and so it's really important for chefs to, to have this kind of consistent product. But it sounds like, you know, because Canada is so young in, uh, in the expression of its wine, um, and maybe there's this beautiful opportunity. Um, do you find like, do, do, is that that derived for consistency? So like, I, I go, oh, okay, I got a wine from Bella and it's the, the best wine I've ever had in my life. Um, but Bella's on this regenerative journey 
which means that it might change. Like, so could my favorite wine then actually change? And am I going to, am I as a customer going to be happy about that? Or am I going to be disappointed? Um, it, it will, 100% it will. Um, and that, I mean, that comes down to a number of factors, really. Um, I'll kind of romance that in a second. But yes, your wine will absolutely change every single year. And I guess it really depends on what you're looking for with consumption. Um, I think it's, it's nice to become attached to a varietal and know like, I love Pinot Noir, and then be able to sort of explore other variations of Pinot Noir from different producers. Because um, you can kind of get a basic style down. So you understand that you like light body, high acid wines and things like that. But the, the most beautiful thing about wine, and this is what this is sort of the romance and what gets me so excited about it. I'm going to nerd out really hard for a minute. <laughs> yeah, is, um, bring it. <laughs> but every bottle of wine is so special and completely unable to be replicated. Um, Bella, I mean, there's one of these, there's one beautiful wine that I, I snapped up a few bottles of I'm going to use there. It's called their King's Method uh, Ancestral. So it's from a vineyard in 2016. Uh, they were only able to produce 360 bottles, I think, from this vineyard. Um, but in 2016, it was an absolutely perfect year for growing Chardonnay grapes. Um, they had the right amount of heat, the right amount of moisture. The season went quite long. There wasn't, uh, like the fires in BC weren't happening to the extent that they are right now. 2016 was a little more mellow with things like that. Um, and the wine was exceptional, but they only grew 680 or they only had 360 bottles of it. I, I can't remember how many hectares of grapes they had. Um, but the following year, something happened and they ripped out all of those vines. They don't even exist anymore. So this bottle that I have, one of only 360 bottles that was produced for the entire world to consume. You have to think about that. It's, it's not just Canadians that want these wines. There's people all over the world that want them. We are going after wines in Italy and Germany and France and Spain, and we're trying to get our hands on them. And it's some, it's the same case for some of those wineries over there. They only make 500 bottles a year. Um, but you're kind of tasting this little piece of history. So you get to taste the craft of that winemaker, sort of his artistry and his plans for that fruit. You get to taste exactly what the climate did, that gorgeous sun-kissed fruit. Um, and you're, you're only one of a few hundred people in the world that get to experience the beauty of that. So, um, so yes, yeah, so wine will change every year, but that's kind of the exciting thing. And I mean, it's fun to nerd out and taste different vintages and check out the variations of it, but I mean, you don't have to go that deep. You, it's just fun to experience a bottle and know that you're one of only a thousand people in the world that gets to taste that wine in that expression in that moment in time. So. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that is, that's beautiful. And maybe I'd indulge me everyone for a moment. So I was in France um, with a, with a choir that I sing with and uh, we had been driving from Paris to Dijon, the Dijon area. So we're driving past a bunch of fields. And when I tell this story, I say it was like I was home. Um, you know, oat crops, barley crops. Um, the only difference was that the granaries that I see here in, in central Alberta were made out of stone. And then every now and then you'd see this massive chateau. Um, and so a little bit different, but we drove into the Dijon area uh, and that night went out for dinner. I think it was a, well, a little local restaurant. Um, and one of the guys I was with ordered a bottle of wine. And I remember, <clears throat> And I, yeah, I think part of it was just kind of feeling so nostalgic about the place. Like, I mean, in, in a foreign country, but I'm feeling kind of this, this sense of home. Um, and the Dijon area is, is well known for its Pinot, um, which I didn't realize until I got there. Um, and uh, so we, we, you know, sniffing the, the, the aromatics. Um, and as soon as the smell hit my nose, I started to get emotional. It smells like burgundy is yes sorry yeah. well, continue but yes and and so and it, it was it was like I don't know if, if the people on the call have ever watched Ratatouille but I had an Anton Ego moment in, there and 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 uh, was taken back to my childhood I grew up on a farm here in central Alberta 
And uh, as a kid, my great aunt and uncle across the way, they had milk cows. Um, and so they would, we would walk over and, you know, as little kids and we get our ice cream bucket of milk that we would drink for the week. Uh, and every time that we showed up, Aunt Tina would give us a raspberry candy. And so something about this raspberry candy, this kind of milky barnyardy kind of smell that was their house, all came kind of just crashing back to me. And uh, yeah, tears filled up my eye. And, you know, so when you talk about about kind of the romance of wine uh, and just the power that that it has, like it's quite astounding. And so yeah, that's partly why I say like for those that weren't in the call ahead of time, I put in Pinot Noir as my favorite wine because I've had this this kind of moment. Um, and uh, and what I hear what you're saying, Britt, is that is that each bottle kind of can carry that 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 magic. Um, and if we're ready to receive it, um, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of have that same kind of experience. Yeah. Well, and it's so funny that you mentioned Burgundy. So in my, in my very beginnings in wine, uh, working at J Webb, which is one of the city's oldest shops, um, they, I was always sort of, you kind of, I find you either love Bordeaux or you love Burgundy. And Bordeaux is these beautiful, huge estates. You, you drive to Bordeaux and you drive to that south part of France and it's very stark. The soils are quite, um, everything just feels kind of cold and imperial. And then you go to Burgundy and it's the exact opposite. I've, I've never been, unfortunately. I really wanted to go last year, but um, other, other things came up. Um, but the owner of the winery, and these are some of the most icon iconic wineries in the world. Some of them only have the ability pr to produce 120 bottles a year from some of their vineyards. Uh, but the owner of the winery is, a, is the farmer and he jumps off the back of a wagon with dirty hands. And he's like, oh yes, come like eat, eat, try my grapes, look at my vineyards. And he's so happy to show off his farms where uh, yeah, in Bordeaux, they're very happy to show off their estate. They want to show off the grandeur and in Burgundy, they get it and they get that it's the soils and it's, and it's the farmers and it's the care in the vineyard that creates this beautiful fruit. There's, there's no intervention to it. It's natural. And that's, I think you get that when you smell these wines, you can smell all of the love that kind of goes into them. So that's awesome. That's the experience you had. Yeah, I, I love it. Um, and maybe there's um, any any final thoughts, comments about you know Canadian wineries versus the global kind of picture. Like, is there anything that you want to tell us about Canada versus the world, or Canada with the world in terms of the wine industry? Yeah, I think um, I think it's really important to remember that not all regions produce the best varietal. Um, you kind of have to think of, of grapes in, in a very broad sense. Not all grapes are created the same. Um, I kind of like to use the analogy that grapes are like apples um, and you can get a Fiji apple that tastes really good from this region or an ambrosia from here or whatever it is. But even more than that, there's um, certain fruit that doesn't grow well in Canada. Pineapples will never, maybe never grow here. I mean, we're making kiwis in Canada now, so that's a thing. But, um, but our climate's really suited to um, sort of high acid varietals of grapes. So if you're looking for Canadian wine and you're looking for full bodied reds, um, similar to like Grenache or Tempranillo or something that you would maybe find from Spain, sort of Brian going back to your love for Grenache, um, they don't do incredibly well in Canada. So it's kind of, if you're looking for really good Canadian wine, you should be looking for Pinots, looking for Rieslings, looking for Chardonnays. Um, we're starting to get better at Syrah, surprisingly. But I think, yeah, with Canadian wine, it's kind of important to understand what we do really well and embrace that. And then on the international sort of scope of things, again, just popping into, going, going and talking to some experts. I'm, I'm an open book at this point. So anybody on this call is welcome to poke me on Instagram or email me or bug me. Uh, with any questions you have, but um, but yeah, to to understand what each region does really well, and go to that region for those things, and understand that um, it's okay sometimes. I mean, we want to be as local as possible, but it's also uh, it's okay to support some of these international producers that are also doing things in sort of 
changing the game in terms of winemaking. Um, if you're looking for a particular style that Canada doesn't do well because we might not ever be able to do those wines well. Brilliant, that's so great. Um, I would love to, I know we've been having a great time and I'm sure that there's others here on the call that maybe have a couple of questions that have been inspired by this conversation. And so I'd love to open it up to anyone that has questions and you can either unmute yourself and ask the question uh, or you can type a question in the chat. Um, anything in terms of your own wine journey that uh, having this expert with us might be able to address any questions coming up for people. And maybe as people are getting the, the gears going, um, I will jump back into what Britt had, had mentioned earlier is that uh, YWC Growers is launching a wine club, uh, a sustainable wine club. We were calling it a regenerative wine club. Um, but uh, it's going to be very limited. I think we only have 12 spots available. Um, and I think it's, we're putting it out first to our subscribers. And so what we want to ensure that you know is that next week um, we will start kind of letting people know that, um, that they can, if this is something that, that you're interested in, that you can, can follow the links uh, after you receive that message in your, in your inbox. If you're not already a subscriber, um, now's a great time to get involved um, if you want to be part of the wine club. And so if, if you want, um, I, we've got a coupon code. It's called YWC Education. Into the, into the chat. And so that will allow you to get a subscription to our harvest boxes, which then will ensure that you get all of the messages about this a wine club that we're about to about to launch um and maybe Britt just uh maybe make a couple of comments just about how how the the wine club will be structured yeah so we um so there'll be the wine club uh which we're kind of going to theme around seasonally um food and wine should always be paired together i think um so it's important to drink wines that taste well with what's in season uh, so we have our summer box coming out and then there'll be something that's coming out uh, later in the fall. But we've chosen three, we wanted the, the wine club itself to be uh, as local as possible. So we've chosen three uh, producers from British Columbia that we'll be working with. Uh, Bella Farms will be one of them and um, we're using their Pinot Blanc, which is uh, the first time they've ever made it, which is really, really fun. They've got it. It's, there's something different on their website. I think there's 780 bottles total made, I think about 48 of them made their way to Alberta. So we were very happy to get our hands on 12 of those 48 that are in the province. Um, and then we're going to be using something from Jou Farms, which is, uh, or Avril Creek. Um, and then there's Jou Line, which is a little farm and winery out on Vancouver Island, um, run by a couple of Calgarians, which is really fun. A friend of mine from junior high actually is the vineyard manager there. Wow. And then, um, and then we're gonna be using Blue Mountain. So Blue Mountain has up until this moment only ever been available to purchase through JWeb. And they were very, very generous in allowing us to um, take some of those wines. So their production so small, they've really only ever wanted to be available in a very limited number of places. So JWeb's the only place in Alberta, aside from YYC growers now that um, those wines can be found. So. Yeah, so it's going to be really fun. And we'll start off with 12. I don't think it'll ever be something that's big. I mean, there's no capacity to make it huge because there's such a limited amount of these wines in there. Yeah. Right. And, and you will be doing all of the, the brokering and the connecting and choosing of the wines that are seasonal and um, kind of interesting. Yeah, so there'll be some really fun tasting notes. Um, I've, on top of wine, I've worked closely in the food industry for a number of years and um, have the luxury of being married to a chef so I can always bounce food and wine pairings off of him. Um, so yeah, so there'll be food pairings, suggestions with what to eat, um, some fun facts about the wineries as well, uh, maybe some exclusive one-on-one -on -one conversations or tidbits from the winemakers that will be included in the club. So it's, it's meant to be fun and informative um, 
and I think it's quite special. So I'm really, I'm really thrilled to have had the privilege to build it. Yeah, that's we're very excited about it too, and and excited that um, that we can kind of carry on our sense of purpose in the world about uh, healing the earth while we grow food, and that yeah, that wineries are 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 doing the same work, um, and I think yeah, we we need to make that impact on a global scale, and uh, why not enjoy, have a little bit of fun, you know, see what see where your nose takes you um, when you kind of put your nose in, into the top of the bottle or uh, into the top of the glass of wine. Yeah, well, yeah. And, um, if there's no more, if there's no questions, I'll keep going. Nobody wants to raise a hand. Or um, but on top of the wine club, uh, there's going to be a shop as well. So the wine club um, is quite special. Um, it doesn't, it's not the most um, I think I think the price point matches the quality of the wine, but also understanding that sometimes you just want a, an $18, $20 bottle of wine that you can drink on a Tuesday night. So we also decided to do um, an online shop. So the wines again follow the same ethos. The shop is um, the shop is going to be coming later, and I think Sarah will have more info. There'll be emails going out about that as well, I believe. Um, but that's also going to feature six different wines. Um, not exclusively from Canada, so there'll be some of these amazing winemakers internationally we were talking about. Um, but they'll, I mean, you can, I think you'll be able to throw them into your YYC growers box, um, which is kind of nice. So you can, if you don't have time to go check out one of the shops that I was sort of singing the praises of, you can, you can grab a bottle of something and have it with your dinner that week and there'll still be food, food pairings and tasting notes and all of those good things so that you've kind of got that guided experience. So that's, that's fascinating because I think, I mean, my instinct, um, just listening to you talk and listening to the, to the farming practices of the wine, wine, or wine farms, <laughs> um, it made me think, okay, it's going to be a $40 bottle of wine minimum. Uh, but you're saying that some of this wine is done kind of in the $20 range. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, um, I mean, Canada, our, our agriculture is just a little bit more expensive out here. Why land costs more money? Um, our wages are higher. There's there's a whole bunch of different reasons why. Um, if you're buying sustainable wine from Canada, it costs more than buying sustainable wine from Italy. Typically, the land's a little bit cheaper, which sounds shocking. Um, their cost of living isn't as high as it is here in Canada, so their minimum wage isn't as high. Um, but to the note of sustainability, it's always important to make sure that whatever sustainable acts you're taking in the vineyard are also sustainable for the staff that you keep. Um, that's kind of the whole, the whole holistic process of it all. But um, it is it is very challenging to find very good quality Canadian wine that sort of ticks all those boxes. Blue Mountain does a pretty good job and Sperling is one of these amazing vineyards who um, seems to churn out gorgeous wines that are biodynamic and sustainable um, at around $20 a bottle, but she's been doing it for 20 some odd years. So her land was probably cheaper when she bought it in the eighties. Um, but yeah, so to that note, we are going to be using some producers from Australia and some producers from Italy as well. So we can get those um, sort of 19 to $24 price points uh, in and available for people as well. Britt, we know that you kind of run and operate kind of your own things in the world. Um, is there is there ways that uh, those of us on the call can reach out to you or find you and help support kind of the, the beautiful work that you're doing in the world? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in addition to this, this lovely little consulting piece that I'm doing with YYC Growers, uh, my husband and I run a catering, um, and we call it a catering company. It's kind of a all hands in a food and wine company called Harling Food Co. Um, so if you ever have questions about wine, if you would like to book a tasting, um, if you want someone to ever curate some wine packs for you, if you just kind of want to chat about whatever, <laughs> uh, you can send me a DM there. Um, so just, again, it's just harlingfoodco.com. I'll type it into the, the chat line. Um, that's our website so you can shoot me an email or again check us out on Instagram but um, I tend to post a good amount of wine stuff there um, and then a fair amount of it comes off of my personal feed so if you're so inclined to watch the 
the happenings of my sweet family as well, you can just find me uh, at Brit Hart, H-A-A-R-T. Um, yeah, but um, but yeah, and again, I'm I'm happy to to kind of reach out and help in any way. I just I love seeing people make the connection between food and wine, and um, letting them know that it's not cost prohibitive to be able to support wineries in the same way that you support local farmers. So, yeah, beautiful. And uh, we all need that support. Uh, we love people like you, Britt, that are kind of building and making those connections. Because um, I think every time that we connect a little deeper to the, the planet on which we find our life and sustenance um, and recognize that, yeah, it's been giving and giving and giving to us. Um, it's really time for us to, to kind of really start thinking about how do we give back. And I think one of those beautiful ways is by enjoying food from YWC growers because you can trust that our farmers are doing everything they can to kind of make the ecosystem as fully functioning as possible and love having this other pleasurable way to uh, to kind of make that connection with with wine as well well again Britt uh, I, I see you're kind of typing in a few things into the chat I want to make sure that those get in um, to answer a couple of these questions Brian asked if you've got social media platforms that tell stories uh, and I know I've seen stuff at the Harlem Food Co. Um, and then your personal one, what is that one called? Um, so I just posted Harlem Food Co's blog. I uh, recently just did a post on a number of the different wineries um, that we had been talking about. So Daydreamer, um, Bella and a few others. So you can find that, um, you can find that on Harlem Food Co's blog if I'm ever feeling really romantic, I'll go into news a little bit. Um, and then, um, yeah, you can also, I mean, feel free to creep on me on Instagram. You can just follow me at Brit H-A-R-T as well. But uh, yeah, I love the idea of doing uh, a long table tasting. That would be amazing. Well, really, really appreciate you taking the time out, Brit. Um, we love what you're doing. Love the, the passion that you have for connecting with these farmers. And uh, yeah, everyone else, keep your eyes peeled to your communication from YWC growers to to see when and, and how to get involved with uh, with the wine club and uh, yeah hopefully we can have a long table dinner very very soon now that things have been been opening up thanks everyone